It will change while you're living in this world. Uh, it will change because it, it changes in this world while you're living. It will actually change your destiny in the world to come. In Mark 10, 23 20 through 27, Jesus looked around about and said unto the disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto him, to them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom. In other words, he's saying it is easier to thread the eye of a needle with the camel than for a rich man to get into the kingdom. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked upon them and said, With men it's impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. I understand this to mean that it's God who saves. Left to man, salvation is impossible. And we'll see that the disciples later on, they catch this. This, this, this is a, seems like a, a, a simple point, but this is, it makes a very profound distinction. It is God who saves. And, you know, this is absolutely essential and important to remember this uh, very practical truth because uh, we're still in a body and we have not been fully saved yet. We've been delivered from this body. I mean, we've been delivered from this world. That means we've been set free. We, we were a prisoner. Now we're no longer a prisoner. God has set us free. We're still in the world, though, and we're still in this body. Christ has put us in his body. For sort of kind of like safekeeping. And this is where we grow. And this is where we can, we can go out in the green pastures and get living waters and come back into security of the fold, the body of Christ. But we're still in the world. And we, uh, we haven't been taken out of the world and we haven't faced death. But God who is faithful, not only can he save, he will save. Mm -hmm. Now I marvel at the, at the sensitivity of disciples. You have to when you read the accounts like this. You always marvel at the disciples. They're incredible how they just, they just really just go after everything Jesus says and they pick up and leave when Jesus does and it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Jesus did a lot of things while he was among them, among men. Uh, John gives us some example in the in conclusion of his letter. He finishes 21, 25, he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. But... Uh, now, Matthew Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have a record of the rich young ruler. And, and this was right after. They, they saw, they saw this, the, that they needed to put this in. This was significant. And this was right after uh, Jesus had gathered all the children in his arms. And he blessed them. And, and he told them that unless you receive the kingdom as one of these, you cannot enter therein. This was right, and this is when the man came running up to Jesus and asked for eternal life. These are the kind of things, you know, the disciples were uh, witness to all, all, all day long, every day. This had been a journey for them now for uh, probably six months or more, this cycle they took back around uh, and Jordan come back to Jerusalem. They, every day they, they had some kind of something happen like this. And Jesus was teaching them the exclusive nature of the kingdom of God. He was teaching them the uniqueness or the, the, uh, the single one-of-a-kind uh, kingdom um, he was teaching them that there's nothing like the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is designed to get you out of this world where the wrath of God is directed. There were many who came to Jesus. Um, many came to be healed. They came to be fed. Some came to trap him. Some came to tempt him. And others had some kind of question or some kind of controversy they wanted to wrap him up in. And, of course, we know in John 3 that Nicodemus came to Jesus uh, with a pretty good question. It was concerning the nature of spiritual life. But this one comes, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In this account, the, the rich young man came to Jesus. He came running to Jesus. He knelt at Jesus' feet. He, he asked him the right question. Uh, he had a good start. It was refreshing, actually, to see some to hear of somebody running to Jesus, you know, actually enthused about uh, how, I, how, how can I get this eternal life? Uh, and then Jesus beholding him, he loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, whether they be rich or poor, all men must come to Jesus. 
And since we all must come to him, then fundamentally we're all in the same condition. We need Jesus. We need him to come into the kingdom of God. So if you desire to come into the kingdom of God, then you will come to Jesus. And if you've came to Jesus, you've come to the right person. We continue to need him to stand fast in the kingdom. We never, there's never a time in, in our lives that Jesus is not applicable to us. Uh, Jesus is the one that's going to finish our work of salvation. Brethren who have difficulty in any area of life, they need Jesus. Those who help us in this, we call them brethren. Brethren minister to one another in this way. They're always pointing us to Jesus and somehow. And when we, the brethren, do this, we really have no need for different and special other functions than what other the body uh, provides. Marriage specialists, financial specialists, managers, youth leaders, we don't need any of these when the body is ministering to one another. Thou lackest one thing, just one, Jesus said, the most important thing. In this regard, Jesus does require the same from all men, rich or poor. And those who refuse to give it to the world are those who have all the problems of salvation. You look and see. What was needed for this man to gain eternal life? It's the same for all men who desire this. Keep in mind, whatever Jesus said to this man, though, he said it to, them, he said it to him out of love. It says he loved him. That's something else that you might want to consider. Will Jesus receive all men just as they are? You ask that question? Well, Jesus loved this man, but by no means would he receive him. Jesus was willing to receive him, but the world stood between him and Jesus. The world stood between the two of them. Now the disciples, uh, we always see them doing and, 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 and acting as real disciples do. They are listening and they're learning. And it appears that they understood the entirety of what Jesus was saying about this matter of, eternal, uh, of entering the kingdom of God and, and getting eternal life there. Uh, I, I want to make a point of this in a moment and come back to this. But I want to, I want to stop for just a second and think on this a moment. What about in our day? I, I, what, in a, what about in our time? Um, how about our religious leaders today? who are always appears, it, it always appears that they're, they're always in the middle of some huge building project, millions of dollars. Maybe it's to, to, uh, to uh, add on a building, or maybe it's to uh, build a family life center, or, uh, or something of this nature. But it's, it's always some kind of building program. They need a lot of funds. Here comes the rich young ruler. Okay, here he comes. Uh, well, uh, I know the rich. Don't come to our religious leaders anymore. Now, this rich man came to Jesus, but it's not that way anymore. Uh, the, our religious leaders go to the rich. But just suppose that the rich did come, okay? Uh, you wonder what they would hear. Yeah, but yeah. I, there's a variety of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's one thing you can be sure of. They're not going to hear. They're not going to hear what we're going to hear today. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to hear. Well, God, God has provided the funds we needed, praise his name. You're not going to hear any of that. The, close, the observation was made a few weeks ago in our meetings that how the teachings of Jesus are treated as though they're irrelevant. Mm -hmm. they, they really just don't apply. They're significant and important, they, but they really don't have the relevancy uh, because all of this happened before the New Testament church. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the modern church, has they're culturally adapted what Jesus has said in order to fit into their, uh, into their arrangement of things. And they have a term for this. They call it redefining the gospel. Mm -hmm. But you and I know, both know that the world and the kingdom of God work as opposites with one another. And you simply can't come in one or the other having either the kingdom or, or the world. You, you can't e enter either one with them. Preachers who have the world's ear, preachers who are t talking and preaching to most of the world, um, they're not going to preach this. Now they're not going to tell people this, even though they know it's to be true. Mm -hmm. And it's, you'll look and see, and you can observe, it's these same preachers and teachers who, who have not done themselves what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do. Well, uh, what I'm trying to say is this, this is a false message. This word of faith message we're hearing today, We've, it's called the prosperity gospel. This is a, uh, 
It's a, it's a false message. 